Um, and it's kind of mixing together psychology and machine learning, which are usually not always. So it is really fun, but the challenge is to, you want to go deep enough so that they have an understanding. They just have, instead of just names, they really have an understanding, but you don't have the time to go, yeah. I have the same issue for, yeah, that I can understand. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, facial expression, huh? you see the facial expression. Uh, <laughs> I can see that. Uh, we'll see how much of confusion we get from today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I think uh, I'd like to get started. Thank you all for coming. So today we have uh, LP, he's semi-new uh, faculty here at CMU. He's in the uh, LTI, Language Technology Institute. Uh, but before coming to CMU, he was at USC. Mm -hmm. And then he did all of his graduate work at MIT. And if you have read through his bio, you'll see that he's gotten a lot of media attention. And of course he has seven best paper awards at different conferences, ACM, IEEE conferences. Um, really had just been very really successful in his early research career. Uh, right now he's working on something called SimSensei. Is that still it's still ongoing? It's still ongoing, yeah. A big DARPA project. Um, so this is like the, psych the psychological simulation interactions between people. Yeah, human communication. Okay. So are you going to be talking about that? Yeah, I will. <laughs> yeah. Today, so uh, glad to have LP here. Um, and thank you very much for speaking to our audience. Good. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I like how you guys start with applauding. <laughs> In case it's not good, that's where you go. <laughs> it's right away. Uh, Louis Philippe uh, became in the yes uh, in the U.S. LP. Way too long name, Frenchy. They're hard to pronounce. LP. Uh, and as you will see, my interest is uh, somewhere between uh, AI. Uh, machine learning uh, and psychology. I really strongly believe that these are uh, coming closer together and the last piece you're going to see also is healthcare. So somewhere in that middle that's really where the research is. So the communication is central to all our interaction and some will argue even to our intelligence a communication. Really early on we learn to express emotions, happiness, surprise or even sadness. This comes really early on and if you think about the relationship between a mother and her child, communication is at the center and as we grow up we learn different aspects of it to the point where we're able to work in that kind of environment. So communication is so central. So you will think when we look at uh, computers, uh, communication should also be central. But how are human communicating? A lot of our communication is multimodal. The word we say, how we say these words, and also the visual aspect. What I call the three V of communication. Verbal, vocal, and visual. So how we communicate with computers? with keyboards, with mouse, these are the pre earlier, and as we're now building new approach to, and I think there's a lot of them building here, we are seeing new ways of communicating with computers. I personally believe that one of these ingredients has to be human multimodal communication. We need to have computer able to understand, analyze, and maybe even generate this aspect of communication. So when when we think about building these new embodied AI or embodied intelligent machine, or even the non-embodied one, embodied meaning that there is a body like a virtual human, uh, like either a virtual human or a robot, or when you look at non-embodied, all of these cell phones, I, I strongly believe a human communication will be centered to that. So when we building and learning that, you have to think about four main aspects of human communication. The first one is each behavior 
A smile has its own dynamic. The multimodal is this aspect of uh, speech, gesture, and vocal, but there's the interpersonal dynamic that you have to take into account, and also the social. Let me give you more details what I mean by each of them. And each of them, what's interesting, they each bring some interesting research questions. So, what is behavioral dynamic? Uh, and a good example, what I call the 50 shade of yeah, is listen to this. This is from a meeting. We have plenty of meetings. And an hour of meeting, and I pick the only the yeah. Yeah? Of all in this meeting. And look at the intent behind each of them. And just how slightly changing the vocal aspect is will change the intent of it. Second of it, if you do, are in the speech community, try to find the identity of that uh, speaker. He's a really well-known speech uh, uh, researcher. Yeah. 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 Yeah
So the amount of information in one word is really high, while if you think about signals like vocal and visual, often they're sampled at a much higher frame rate, which we each sample can be a lot less uh, informative. Specifically for if you think about speech, you need a lot longer to be able, more samples to be. So how do you do this fusion? How do you learn the complementarity between, uh, between um, modalities? And one thing we learned from audiovisual speech recognition, it's not because it's multimodal that it's better. It's not always better. Audiovisual speech recognition is a lot of supplementary, meaning that uh, they are exactly, or a lot of the same information is encoded in each modality. Only if one, one of the modalities is noisy, do you end up using the other modality. So this is uh, really important. You want to model all of these together. The last, the, the third one is what we're doing right now, is really interpersonal. Looking at only one person's behavior really is only a small aspect of the whole story. And so I'm going to show a quick video, and I want you to look at two things. Her behaviors as being someone who is a patient with distress or anxiety, and look at how good uh, her be gesture will be to be able to uh, calm the person and create a lot more uh, closeness in the, in the uh, hopefully the sound will work here. Oh, I think that that's, that's the how strong the reaction should say you're Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't suffocate, but I was very uncomfortable. Like, it never happened. So at the end, we saw this beautiful mirror smile. Uh, what, can you see the tenseness in her hand? You can see her rocking. Uh, you even hear in the voice the tremble, the, the, a lot of the tenseness in the voice. She is great. Uh, her gesture, we studied her, her gesture for a long time. Um, she does at some point, these people, don't, don't worry about them. She's pushing them away. Uh, everything you say is between us. Beautiful dome, protective dome. Uh, we do all these. Uh, so how do we interpret them and eventually maybe create a virtual human or a robot that can use these kind of gestures uh, as part of communication? And so, and so the challenge there are really to model the synchrony between people, the change, uh, each person is slightly different, not everybody. One thing we thought is like uh, nods, head nods. What's an agreement head nod versus a continuation head nod? Agreement versus continuation. You will think continuation are like this. Or an agreement will be a lot stronger. There is a lot of difference between people, and so everybody has their own scale. And we know that really well from speech uh, recognition, where you need to adapt. So the same thing exists when you do this. And the last one, which we had already an example with the proxemics, there's a lot of change in how people are behaving from culture to culture. Uh, there's a great example, uh, Japanese. Sometimes when you have someone of a higher rank, you may not explicitly say no, but you may bring it into the, your behavior that this is something you are not as positive about. Uh, but these different, uh, French Canadian are uh, uh, large, no? uh, how do you, uh, no, well, not just give some joke. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot into the cultural, and that's really important. I'm not going to focus as much today on that aspect, but I think this is where the, a lot of the research is going on now. Uh, how do you look at it international or in the different cultures? So. Why do you care about all of this human communication dynamics? It has a lot of possible application. The first one I believe is, is going to be this seen in the short term is medical. Doctors, when you think about it, when they look at depression, or more importantly, suicidal ideations, there are about 40 teenagers a week going to the ER with suicidal ideations. Suicidal ideation means either a direct attempt or a direct uh, disclosure of suicidal uh, idea. A doctor has to decide, once he sees the patient after 10 minutes, am I going to put 
him or her on medication, send them in therapy, or send them back home. These are really hard decisions that have to be done, a lot of it through subjective intuitions. Uh, and so how can we give them objective measures that can help them. And as you can probably expect, that can also expand to a lot more like autism, psychosis, and schizophrenia. The second field where I think a lot of it is going to change uh, is online learning or learning in general education, but specifically for online learning. Because we are learning, we're face to face, you know, do our homework often maybe by meeting together at a room. But now we're seeing more and more people learning from the web. How can you get the same face to face interaction or the strand of face to face while doing a, a remote interaction? And can you have a possibly a virtual peer and can you I could replace you guys, I don't know if you see the image, it's a virtual audience, uh, for training. You'd like to train uh, people in general, or maybe someone with autism uh, who is really strong uh, and, but may have some problem with presentation. Uh, so we'll have a virtual audience like you guys, so attentive. Uh, but the version we have also, we have a tweaking. So at some point, people start looking at their cell phone, at their computers, and all this. How do you train people? It's a really interesting problem. Why? Why is it happening now, all of this research? I think it's happening now for at least three reasons. But one of the main ones is there's a lot of data available now to build a lot of these models. We can get a lot of information from YouTube or even from Skype. We get a lot of this data set available. We have a lot more power. and. What we've seen in computer vision, a lot of change. So what we had in, uh, previously was manually annotated data, uh, but now we have stronger speech recognition, we have stronger computer vision, we have stronger speech analysis. That allows us to look at how to put them together. And why doing it here? <laughs> if you think about it, AI is, it's, it's not a new idea. The idea of learning how humans are interacting and communicating was part of the kind of the original idea of AI. That's one of this. But now we have the tools to approach it. So how do, can we bring together natural language, speech, computer vision, and machine learning to be able to infer all of these different aspects of psychological, cognitive or social aspect of human interactions. So that's a big goal. That's a long-term goal. I'm going to try to give you some example of, uh, that we've done in that direction, uh, bringing it a little bit closer. But what I want to emphasize is multimodal has many names. Uh, and it's in different fields have a slightly different uh, uh, focus. In speech, it, it, in fact, if you think of the first multimodal, some of the first one was in speech. We've seen a lot of really interesting work in multimedia with cross-event, uh, cross-modal uh, event retrieval. In effective computing in the last 10 or 12 years, there's a lot of effort on audiovisual emotion recognition. Uh, multimodal language processing in ACL and EMNLP. If you look now, suddenly, computer vision suddenly opened up in the last few years with image captioning, video representation. It's so exciting because now we have researchers going to ACL and CVPR and going to ICML. It's really interesting to see this. And in machine learning, in the last four years, you see a lot more papers pushing the envelope of our multimodal deep learning. We have to put deep, that's important. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of really interest. So, let me give you what I believe are at least three of the main uh, challenges. One is the behavioral. You want to learn for each behavior, each smile, each word, yeah. You want to learn, analyze its dynamic. The second aspect is when you think of multimodal, how should you represent together these multiple different modalities? And how can you learn to synchronize them? 
and how can you interpret them? So for each of them, there are many research questions uh, that can be taught about. And if you think about, for example, let me just give one of them, how do you learn structure of behaviors? You want to use and in fact study the latent structure of each of these behaviors. In the case of multimodal representation, you want to be able to learn a representation, a nonlinear representation that allows also for temporal contingency. And then you want to be able to learn synchrony and how to interpret. Because if I show you a video, not everybody has the same interpretation. So let me give you an example just to make it clear why, uh, what are the kind of input in that kind of algorithm. And then we're going to get in the math, which is the fun part. But um, what, give me an example, which is Sim Sensei. I did spend uh, three years of my life on this, so I'm really excited. It was a large uh, project. Uh, I, I, there was a large team in this, but the idea here was to have patient interacting with a virtual interviewer or with a real interviewer, human interviewer, either through Skype with the human interviewer or live with a virtual interviewer. And as they interact, we are going to look at their behaviors objectively look at their vocal, visual, and verbal, the 3 V, and then we'll give this information to the clinician so that they can better assess the patients. Where do you use that technology? You can use it for screening, early screening, but if you ask me where is it going to be used, it's for treatment. Why for treatment? You see the same person over time in a treatment. Anybody who's done speech analysis or computer or facial expression analysis know the challenges of adapting to a, page, to a person. So I think in treatment you're going to see this technology so that as the person is interacting you can look at the behaviors. And why, why a virtual interviewer? The virtual interviewer is great because they're always going to ask the question the same way. So if you're looking at the response, you always have a standard stimuli to the response. But you can still do with the human interaction, it's just you have to model the variability. So what you want to be able to do is be able to quantify the person's behavior today compared to previous week and maybe even compare with a reference population and be able to do that for different indicators. So let me show you a full system running uh, live, it's all fully automatic, verbal, visual, vocal is automatic, and the virtual interviewer, all of it is, is automatic. So, um, let me show the video. Hi, I'm Ali. Thanks for coming in today. I was created to talk to people in a safe and secure environment. I'm not a therapist, but I'm here to learn about people and would love to learn about you. I'll ask a few questions to get us started. And please feel free to tell me anything. Your answers are totally confidential. Are you okay with this? Yes. So, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. That's good. Where are you from originally? I'm from Los Angeles. Oh, I'm from LA myself. <laughs> when was the last time you felt really happy? <clears throat> Um, but I try to stay happy. Um, I, I'd rather be happy. Uh, my kids keep me going. What advice would you have given yourself 10 or 20 years ago? Um, to, uh, to not believe, uh, to, to not be so gullible, to not be so gullible. So Gullible, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had to Google it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so what you see here, analysis uh, of her vocal, uh, voice quality specifically, her, her gesture, and also we learn a model to be able to animate uh, the virtual human. Uh, so what are the algorithms behind that kind of thing, that kind of technology? If you look at the first step, Oh, yes, there was a question. Is that recorded human speech or speech synthesis has gotten much better than I knew? No, this is, uh, uh, this is all uh, voice actors. And the animations uh, were all done manually. Uh, there is a dictionary of gestures. 
what the AI into this is when should each gesture happen. Um, exactly the problem with text-to-speech. We started with text-to-speech uh, to get that level, level of, uh, of emotion in the voice. We, we had to go with vocal actors. We are now evaluating the difference. So now that we have this system, we can turn on and off things, replace pieces and we're looking at how important it was to have a voice actor but it's ongoing research yeah any more question on the uh, system before I go into the details of some of the algorithms okay yeah so the first aspect is we want to model for each modality independently its own structure so for example Let's say for visual, I'd like to recognize for how people are smiling, how, what is the dynamic of a head nod or a head shake. What is for a phrase, where, what are the phrases, the non-phrases in it, or for vocal, we would like to look at the, the tenseness or the vocal quality. And so you know really well this problem. You have a sequence of data, sequence of observation, and you want to do inference. A simple, nice, uh, beautiful, sequential, uh, supervised learning problem. And there's a lot of approaches that's been developed over the years, looking at different aspects of this problem, looking at generative or discriminative approaches. But what is key here is we want to be able to recognize specific uh, behaviors, but also learn and model its latent dynamic, its hidden changes and phases. So I strongly believe, and I'm at LTI, so I'm giving you uh, a language example, uh, but there's the same thing also is true uh, for all of the modalities, where an example why I'm picking language is uh, each feature is quite uh, in itself, each word is really informative. Uh, and I tell all my students, if you use conditional random field uh, on vision problem, uh, that's not where they were created for. They were created for language where each observation is really informative. So that's a side note on that. But let's look at conditional random field where you are trying to uh, ex uh, infer from your observation, in fact, in this case, the words, you want to infer the state of, of the sequence, so, or the phrase, or the gesture, or the voice quality. And so in this kind of situation, as we know, uh, nothing new here, modeling this through uh, discriminative conditional probability, where each, you have two main components the singular potential and the pairwise potential. Looking at the observation, looking at the dynamic. But that doesn't model the hidden dynamic. We, we want to be able to learn the dynamic of the behaviors. So we will, in our case, in increase this, not to just model direct relationship, but to be able to learn the temporal dynamic. So if you do non-phrases, anybody's done non-phrase uh, or shallow parsing before? Okay, no, okay, so it's a new thing. Non Phrases, uh, looking at the beginning of a noun phrase, uh, you want to be able to identify all the noun phrase in a sentence or an utterance. If you want to do this, it's really helpful to first know part of speech tags. If you know the syntactic information, it becomes really useful. But we're lazy. We don't want to uh, annotate that. So we want a model that learns that automatically for you. So we will use latent variables to model that hidden uh, dynamic. And that's the same thing we'll do for gestures. In our case, we will model this by integrating over that hidden variable. And the trick here is that we will constrain each of the hidden state to be to specific label. So for each hidden state, it will be associated to one specific label. So label of beginning of a noun phrase will have four hidden states, and that will be the same for each of the three. By doing this trick, what's really nice is the complexity of it all becomes exactly the same as a CRF with a simple uh, constrained summation by simply uh, not sharing the hidden state between the, hidden st uh, between the label. We're not sharing hidden state between label. Now, what does it learn? So we're going to train this on a real data set, uh, on a real data set where it is shallow parsing. You give the words, you're not giving it any of the part of speech tags, and then you're giving the label. And what we're going to do is once you learn that model, we're going to look at the test set, 
and look at the hidden label, the hidden state, what are the words associated with it. What's beautiful with that, when you look at the max margin, for each of these hidden states, what you end up learning is the part of speech tags. It's beautiful. Each of them, you have one hidden state that looks at determinant, pronouns, you have for, and that's how usually you start a sentence. And then if you look at continuation, you have the verbs, you have the nouns, you have complements. So that's really interesting. They learn that automatically. And the same thing is true for vision. It's just a lot harder to visualize explicitly. That's why I'm using this one. The second thing I want to say is these hidden variables are learning two things. Intrinsic dynamic and extrinsic dynamic. What does it mean? Intrinsic is how does the uh, samples changes for a specific label. So if I do head gesture recognition, what is the dynamic of a head nod? The extrinsic is how often do I trans how do I go from a head nod to a head shake or head nod to another gesture? So extrinsic is the dynamic between labels. Intrinsic is the internal latent dynamic for a specific. But this is all model in this uh, one latent variable. So that's beautiful. Uh, and that improves also, as I said, over at that point, what was state of the art, uh, state of the art uh, also for vision, which was head gesture. And we've tried it for speech after that. But we're not multimodal. What we want to really look at is multimodal. We're just looking at each modality. But when we look at multimodal, the kind of data we get where people are talking, uh, vocal, visual, verbal, we want to be able to model this uh, jointly. You want to be able to model jointly. And what I will emphasize is I believe there's two types of fusion. There's the instantaneous fusion, where you have observation for each modality, and you want to learn a nonlinear mapping of it. And then there's the temporal one, temporal contingency, to be able to model asynchrony. So how do we address the first one, which learns a nonlinear mapping? Let's go back to that kind of uh, framework. And now we want to learn uh, representation. Representation learning. What should I use for representation learning? Deep. Yeah. Yeah! <laughs> yes, exactly. So we did it before it was called deep, but still. Uh, but yeah, the idea is to learn the representation jointly at the same time as you will learn also the uh, temporal dynamic. So you will learn here how your observation through some kind of layered, and this is, I'm just showing one layer here, you can imagine you can extend that, and how it is, is you're going to have the usual potential function for unary and pairwise, and then we're going to add to it a potential function, uh, and, and uh, similar in some sense to the activation functions of a neural network. Uh, and by doing that, and with the trick, in this case, anybody doing a deep learning, a uh, challenge is regularization. So uh, you need to be smart on your regularization. You could use Dropout. You, at this point, I think we use uh, L1 uh, or Entropy. But you need to regularize it really well. Uh, I think, yeah. So if you do this, what's really great is that you are able to merge uh, in some sense, early fusion and late fusion together. And by doing that, you do improve significantly when you look at emotion recognition. Why do you learn? Because you do two things. A first layer that learn your representation, and a second layer that learn your dynamic, your latent dynamic. And as I was said just earlier, this can be extended to deep uh, representation. Um, and a conditional random field being also energy model with potential functions, uh, that all goes really well. Um, we optimized this one originally uh, with uh, quasi-Newton, but now these days you can do stochastic gradient descent as well. So. Um, and you get improvement when you add deep. Uh, it's debatable, uh, again, about how many layers, but in our case, our deep was only three layers, so not that deep, not 21 layers. Uh, the second challenge is symbols versus signals. Symbols, how many words per second do I speak? 
three, four, maybe five, maybe five per second. How many samples for video do I get? About 30. How many for audio? A lot larger. You would like to be able to learn the granularity. So you have a really high sampling rate for visual and you like to be able to learn the key moments in that video and be able to summarize that so that you can better do the fusion. And that summarization is important. How do you go from high sampling rate video to do a great summarization on this video? You probably know the basic. What are the two first ways of doing that kind of summarization? The first one, really simple, fixed sampling. So I had uh, every four frames, uh, every two frames I drop one, I simply fix frame rate. The second one, that the obvious one will be, look at the frames. If two frames look alike, uh, merge them. But we have a task in mind. We have a task, possibly of recognizing gesture, recognizing emotion. And we are learning these latent space. So what I'm arguing is instead of doing the fusion at the observation or with fix, it's much better to do it at the latent state. The latent state will learn to group together observations that are similar, not visually, but similar with the purpose that you have in mind, like emotion recognition or gesture recognition. And so what you can do is be able to learn automatically a multi-layer multi or hierarchical uh, conditional random field that will allow you to do that fusion automatically. And so I'm skipping some of the uh, math behind it, uh, but the general uh, challenge is to decide when to merge two hidden state or two hidden variable, and that's a hyperparameter that is uh, learned automatically from the data, uh, and I can give you more details if you're interested. But what you get is n not only a summarization, but an improvement. Why are we improving on something as simple as gesture recognition? Because some gestures, the certain frame are really important. Me opening up, really important for certain gesture. And so if you have 30 frames per second and you're doing a Markov, first order Markov, what are you learning in your first order Markov or CIF if you are learning on videos? You're learning smoothing. That you learn to smooth your data because each observation looks so much alike that the only thing you're going to learn in your pairwise potential is smoothing, or mostly that. But if you have only four observations that are really informative, then the dynamic between them, the pairwise potential, are a lot more informative. So that's one of the reasons, we, uh, and we've tested that, but this representation, the dynamic between them is a lot more informative than the dynamic between these two frames. So, and what you get is also on top of that, you know uh, how each of them, uh, and what's interesting is some, uh, you can see the segments are not equal. So the last part I want to talk about is interpretation. So if I show you videos of a person like her, and I ask you how uh, depressed or how distressed is she, not everyone will agree on the same uh, on, on the same estimate. And on top of that, these estimates are not going to be distress or not. It's going to be a really continuous uh, measure uh, of distress. So how do we, can we take this framework and not do only classification, but do regression? What's really interesting is you want to be able to predict not just distress or not, but being able to predict a measure of distress. What is the challenge when you look at this objective function? What is the, yeah? Uh, how can you, I mean, uh, in this case, how would you quantify people's interpretation of how uh, you see something? Because every person with his own culture, with his own education background will see and interpret something completely different. Yes. So um, that's, <laughs> and that I, I've, I'm not going to emphasize as much in the slide, but the main challenge here is you want to learn a distribution uh, 
over this interpretation. And you want to be able to model uh, a lot of uh, dependent variable, uh, independent variable as well uh, in this case. So you want to be able to look at different culture. What we will do in this case uh, is uh, the simple one of asking many people and look at the distribution of them. But as you can see, you can look at cross-sectional aspect of it, look at specific uh, gender difference or cultural. Uh, we are, uh, this is the ongoing work. This is the future work of that. Right now, we'll simplify the problem and look at it as a distribution over that. That, but that's a really interesting and that's where we're going, I think, with this kind of research. But if you look at this kind of objective function, which is the challenge, which is the mouton noir, the black sheep, uh, the, the, the partition. The partition is the black sheep because you don't have discrete variable anymore. Uh, you have continuous, so you have minus infinity to infinity. What do you do? If you see any of these, uh, the first intuition, or one of the first that could come to mind, is the multivariate Gaussian integral. If I can take this objective function and put it in a form that is Gaussian, then there is, and that's been proven, there is a direct derivation of it. And that's beautiful. So what we will do is we will be really smart on how we select potential function, how we design them. And so we're losing in one aspect because we cannot have any potential function. But as long as they are usually second order, uh, then we, are, uh, we can perform that. So let me give you some example. Oh, I, I, did I cut them? No, OK, yeah. So what is even more beautiful, before I give you an example, is that if you put this in the form of a Gaussian, a Gaussian, what is the maximum of a Gaussian? The mean. So it's beautiful because inference will be extremely easy on this kind of objective function. It will simply be the mean of that. And so the kind of potential function we can do now, because we are not going to do inference through uh, belief propagation or something like this, we can nicely put potential function, all of this long range dependency that we kept wanting to have. We can also uh, start putting sparsity potential. Let's forget this for now, but oh, there's a third one. But what you can do, in fact, is a grid. You can make it 2D. So it doesn't need to be 1D. And inference will also be as easy. And if you look, in fact, for facial landmark detection, uh, this was state of the art uh, last year. And there may be one that's uh, improved, but uh, we are improving. But why can we do this? Is that the inference is done all jointly uh, because of that uh, integral Gaussian uh, formulation. So, and this is true also if you just do regression, this approach improves over the typical SVR as well. So, uh, okay, and I proved that. So, this is a summary, really quick summary of the kind of problems that come in when you look at multimodal machine learning. When you look at multimodal machine learning, you have to understand each modality is dynamic. You want to be able to learn a representation. You want to also look at synchrony. I didn't uh, have time to talk about it, but we have multi-view HCRF, multi-view HCRF, which will look at one modality, a second modality, learn the latent dynamic of each of them, but allow for synchrony between them, allowing uh, uh, potential function between the streams. And finally, we look at interpretation. There is a really interesting question of future work. If you ask me, a lot of the future work is in that interpersonal and cultural aspect of the problem. So, and if you're interested in multimodal machine learning, uh, this is one of this, uh, most of our models are already available online. Um, and I want to show you because I teased you earlier saying, hey, uh, we can infer with this kind of technology. So what we can do now is infer the behavior that are, and we can quantify behaviors most related with depression and distress. So what do you think are the most uh, related behavior related to depression and distress? The first two, not too surprising. <laughs> People who are distressed are showing less joy and more sadness. 
That was not surprising. Another interesting indicator, people who are depressed are looking down more often, less mutual gaze. You see the same number of smile, really surprising, same number of smile between depressed and non-depressed. But what's the difference is the dynamic of them. People have shorter who are depressed are shorter and less amplitude. Why? Probably social norm. We are expected to smile when someone smiles. This mirroring. But we don't want it. So they are reducing this. Another uh, self-adapters or self-touch, although it could be misinterpreted. Uh, so self-adapters are really strong. Specifically, we look at PTSD, a lot of self-adapters on the face. Uh, we see a lot of fidgeting for anxiety. And uh, one that was interesting, the voice. What changes is not really that you're loud or soft, but it doesn't mean that you're depressed. It's the variance on it. So depressed people, uh, as we know, has reduced our psychomotor the retardation, and so we see a reduction there, and we see it also in the voice. And finally, voice quality, a lot more tenseness in the voice that you see in this case. And that is interesting because you see some of them are, genera are, are generalizing between genders. So we talk about cross-sectional looking at genders. And so these are, a lot of them are generalizing. When you look at emotion, that's an interesting one. The, ten the, the direction is the same, uh, but there's a small offset. Uh, between women and men. So women being more, in general, uh, showing more emotion or a wider range of it. Now, let's, what was the most surprising, and that's the next result, was negative facial expression. Disgust or frowning. We were looking at the population, and it was exactly the same between depressed and non-depressed. That was so surprising. But then you separate men and women, and then you get an opposite effect. Men who are depressed show an increase of negative facial expression, like frowning. And see, an ex both for frowning and for disgust, they show an increase. Women show a decrease in facial expression, the negative facial expression. That's really interesting. Why? That's still an open question. Maybe because they're all from Los Angeles? Botox? I don't know. Uh, probably it's something with social norm again. Uh, women may be expected to be more smiley, more happy. Um, and so that's the kind of thing we need to test. And now we have the apparatus to test that kind of research hypothesis. Will it generalize to different city? Pittsburgh? I don't know. Uh, or different culture? That would be really interesting. So that's, but now we have the tool to look at it. And if you integrate all of it together, what you get is the following. So 100 participants. We have a total of 500, but we pick 100 of them for this study. And then what you get here is a measure of distress. Distress is either depression or PTSD. And we rank these 100 people by how distressed they are. Okay, so the blue is their level of distress. And these people are clinically, based on self-report, are, uh, are, are depressed. Okay, based on the measure, uh, this was self-report, so based on PHQ-9 and PCL. In green, what you see is our estimate, is our prediction. So you can see that we're really close to each of them. What's really important for us was you don't want to be here or here because you don't want, and this we look at it as a screening, which is the hardest of the task, is screening. You see that person only for 15 minutes, and you need to make that kind of assessment. Treatment will be much easier, because you can use the change over time. The one question we had is, why bother with a virtual interviewer? Why should you bother with a virtual interviewer? That was the interesting experiment. Half of the people, we told them, behind the curtain, uh, behind there's an operator pressing the button, like a Wizard of Oz operator. And the other half it said, there's nobody behind. It's fully automatic. Uh, it's a fully automatic system. And we did that study twice, once where it was automatic and one where there was a wizard, just to be sure. And the results were the same uh, whenever it was automatic or, uh, or behind. 
When people believe that there is a computer, and it's all about belief, the systems are the same. When they believe it's a computer, they show more fear of evaluation, and they, they talk about more impression um, when it's a human, when they think it's a human. So if they think that there's a human in the loop, they are more fear of evaluation and more impression management. The more interesting, yes? What's impression management? Is, um, you, uh, when you meet friends, uh, you, you, you will be careful on what behavior you show. So you manage how you look, how you give an impression. Uh, and versus, uh, versus at home uh, with your, uh, whatever you wear at home, which I don't want to know. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah that's, that's impression management. Uh, and these are based on scales. So these are on scale, but objectively, there was an increase in how often they show sadness. So people uh, with the virtual, we, and it's the same system. The only thing we showed, we, sh we changed, is telling them that there is a human behind or not. And so that was really interesting. I, now we have to interpret that. So human, when they believe that there is nobody behind, are opening up probably more. That's what we see here. I say Ellie, or the Sim Sensei, is the best thing between a dog and a human. Uh, in the sense that you have a dog, you talk to it, or a journal. You're a journal, you talk to it, nobody's reading it, it's yours. And a human who is reacting to you, although the dog can react also. So, so that was one thing, and I just want to give you two more examples of that technology. Uh, we can do that, use that same kind of technology to predict, are you going to accept the offer? So I'm negotiating with you, and I'm going to look at your nonverbal and predict if you're going to accept the offer. Uh, and if we do look at multimodal, we improve uh, strongly by modeling not just you, not just the respondent, but also by modeling the proposer. So what are the, oh, I don't have this. So what are the most predictive features uh, from a respondent? Pause, it was a really one. Head nods was one. What was really interesting for the proposer, uh, head tilt was really negatively correlated uh, with response. So if you put doubt in your question, and you're not going to get, uh, so, but it's a loop. Uh, you have to think about it. This is really, this is a time slice version of how we really completely want to do it, which is continuous, but it's a first example. And a classic example of sentiment analysis, but looking at videos. There's so many videos on the web, and you want to be able to infer from it, how do you predict um, uh, the sentiment, positive and negative. What's interesting is some modalities, like visual, are really good at, at differentiating positive from any neutral or negative. But vocal is really good at comparing neutral, which is, you could say, objective, from an opinion, and the positive or negative. But by merging them together, you get an improvement. And the last example, which I like very much, how do you differentiate uh, a leader from uh, an expert? And you're like, is it not the same? The leader must be an expert. No, we know really well. It's not because you're loud <laughs> that you are an expert. Uh, so we were looking at voice quality in this case to be able to differentiate experts from uh, leaders uh, just from their voice quality uh, into that, which is really interesting. So this is just some examples of the uh, kind of application you get from looking at human communication dynamic, the behavioral, the multimodal, the interpersonal, and the societal. So merci beaucoup for your attention. Thank you very much. Huh? Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah, so we have time for questions. Interpersonal dynamic. <laughs> Long pause. Yes. I have a question about the video you showed, you showed with the virtual agent talking to the patient. Yes. So there was one uh, one sentence where she said, "I'm from Los Angeles," and she, the virtual agent replied, "I'm from LA too." So, 
does the virtual agent know everything about the patient before interacting? Or? No. Uh, this is uh, speech recognition uh, that happened. Uh, and we do have... Uh, so if you look at the challenge, we didn't solve NLU. We didn't solve natural language understanding. But we solved it enough to keep the conversation going. By enough, I mean there's some key moment that you need to know if a topic has been addressed or not. So here we were looking for the LA topic. And if it was there, she continues. Otherwise, if she's not uh, sure, she has a sentence that is uh, uh, just generic uh, in this case. Uh, so we had enough. What the other thing we, is she has to understand enough to know should she ask the next question or follow up with follow up question to get a little bit more details. So she does NLU, she doesn't solve all of it, but she's just enough for this, yes. Were there cases where the response was awkward or misplaced or something like this? There are, we have a really few uh, out of topic and the reason for that and now you're going to get the, the dirty details, is that the key, imp most important part of this whole interaction, the first minute. The first minute of interaction was the most important. Why? You meet someone for the first time, you're judging them, you're ad adapting. So uh, that's where people come in with the assumption that computers don't work. Uh, even more if they're computer scientists, uh, they, they know that they don't work. So, uh, but the first minute is more than, so we did rapport building in the first minute. It's, that's really the key. And some of the questions are open-ended a little bit like this, but some of them, the follow-up question that she asked after LA is, what do you hate about LA? I don't even need to hear what you said. I know what you're going to say. Traffic. <laughs> So, uh, so we, we did a lot of these questions. Some of them I can completely ignore. If I, if I didn't get a good understanding of what you said, I will ignore it. But I need to have one or two of these questions where I clearly understood what you said. Uh, and that's the kind of thing. So that first minute is important. And then after that, most of the questions after that are open-ended. Uh, so that's mostly going to be follow-up questions, yeah. Yes. Have you explored uh, training psychiatrists? Because I think it's really exciting if you could use the system and also like have like a, basically a second set of eyes on a patient where mm -hmm. the psychiatrist could review it afterwards and say, oh, there's some signs of depression here that I missed yeah. out on. Yeah, uh, and uh, so we're using this system for two ways of training. One is we have a virtual patient. Uh, so instead of virtual interviewer, we can trade virtual patients which is uh, not exactly your question, but that's one way. And I think uh, what we want to do, uh, we started collaborating with Harvard Medical School now, is help also with the training into that. Uh, the challenge is to not be bothering people too often. So when do you give feedback? And that's why we want to work closely with HCI and UI people. When do you give feedback? How do you give feedback? There's a lot of research questions that are unanswered there, yes. But uh, that's why I think sensing is the part we know really well. But how are you going to share that information? There is ethics question, liability questions also. Uh, there's a lot of really fun <laughs> questions also. Yes. Yeah. So when people are interacting with this kind of virtual assistants in a say, patient or a doctor environment, uh, yeah. do they sometimes gauge the amount of artificialness that's generated by this kind of virtual assistants? And in that case, when they see some sort of artificial noise, then how do they react to it? It's so funny. So you would think, and if we had, we don't have the full system running now, so, uh, but uh, we had CMU faculties coming to USC to interact with LA. They know the system, they know it's a computer, they know everything around it. Uh, and they start talking with it. In less than 10 minutes, they started opening up, telling about their family, taking about uh, previous personal details that I'm not going to disclose here. And it's really interesting to see the people opening up. And I think there are two reasons. One is the really well-crafted beginning. And the second one is it feels good just to talk. 
talking feels good. Talking about these things that you're keeping inside. So, so it's rare that someone asks you these questions. So just to be able to talk about it. So really quickly people forget that it's a computer uh, and start opening up. I don't think it will have worked for other domains. Uh, it's really because it's an interview. I think that inter virtual interviewers work it's possible, but it's not going to work for small talk or all of these. There's a lot more AI and research to be done. But for this case, people forgot. And people were supposed to interact 15, 20 minutes. The average is more 25 to 30 minutes. So um, I think we only had early prototype that failed uh, with speech recognition. Oh, how do you want to detect PTSD? have a really bad speech recognizer. Uh, people get angry at it. What, can you repeat? Can you repeat? Can you repeat? Four of them, you know really what the population of both of them. So uh, that's why also we had, if our, if our, our uh, confidence is not high enough, we always have a backup plan to completely ignore uh, the, the role there. So yes. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Thank I you. A, I have a question now. So I'm actually yeah. working with...